Hi everyone, great to be here. Um, so first of all, can I have a show of hands for who knows what the term unicorn refers to? Okay, great. So it's a company that's valued at a billion dollars or more. Um, we've seen a number of breakout companies over the past 12 months. This next session, we have a man with 11 unicorns in his portfolio. From Xiaomi to Slack, Airbnb to ByteDance, and many others in between, he will now fix his eyes firmly forward to explore what industries, countries, and companies will provide us with our next unicorns. In conversation with Henry Sender of the Financial Times, please welcome to the stage Midas List investor, Hans Tung. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, as you know from the program, uh, this panel is about where the next unicorn will come from. And when we were talking yesterday about what we would talk about today, I asked Han, why are you on the wrong side of the Pacific? <laughs> why aren't you here? Since won't the next unicorn come from China? Um. GGV has been around since uh, 2000. We started out in uh, Silicon Valley. And then in 2003, um, we made this little um, investment, this little company that was extremely uh, vocal uh, by the name of uh, Alibaba. And then uh, uh, the valuation of Alibaba back in 2003 was uh, a very expensive $180 million. Um, Two years later, uh, Jerry Yang, on behalf of, of uh, Yahoo, invested one-third of Yahoo's uh, cash on the balance sheet um, at a whopping valuation of $5 billion. Um, This is 2005. And everyone in Silicon Valley on Sun Hill Road thought that it was crazy that there's a bubble in China, and that clearly, given the knowledge of what happened in 2000, that bubble's going to burst. Uh, fast forward today, um, Alibaba is worth half a trillion, and the, um, uh, what we saw in China in the last 13 years taught us a lot. And if, to answer your question, yes, I think that there will be more unicorns coming from China over the next five to ten years uh, than almost anywhere else in the world. And um, not only is the number going to be greater, the size of each could be uh, just as big, if not greater, than their American counterparts. Should we conclude from that that we've seen the best days of U.S. tech, that China will not only dominate but marginalize? Um, we don't look at it that way, um, partially because we think that the Chinese companies are good in certain areas, as you know, and the U.S. have a lead in others. When it comes to um, autonomous driving, we think that the U.S. is definitely as ahead with uh, Waymo. In China, Baidu is doing something, but the actual talent who know how to do autonomous driving tend to be more on the uh, U.S. But the number of areas where U.S. has a clear lead, whether it's on chips, autonomous driving, um, is coming down. And the um, talent level and experience in the scale of Chinese company are growing at a much faster rate. And the Chinese company are growing with less restrictions on experimentation and what they could do in med tech and in uh, AI and machine learning and so forth. So um, the, the two sides will become much closer to each other. And hopefully, it will be more of co-optition, um, friendly but competitive instead of hostile. I mean, if you look at the U.S., a lot of the technology that's actually U.S. technology, whether it's Intel chips or a lot of other technology, originally comes from Israel. Mm -hmm. Do you see any other places in the world that will give rise to unicorns in coming years? Although we don't have uh, much investments in India, 
I'm a small personal investor in both uh, Flipkart and Snapdeal. Uh, in Snapdeal since 2012. Um, we think that India and Indonesia um, potentially uh, 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 Russia in Eastern Europe and uh, different parts of the Middle East can give rise um, to unicorns. And it's possible that could happen even in Latin America with Brazil and to some extent Mexico. So we think that the number of unicorns that's coming out from the rest of the world will be greater than before as smartphone penetration continue to um, uh, take its course. Another thing we also see is that both American and Chinese companies are increasingly more active beyond their home court to expand their business or make strategic investments in uh, developing countries around the world. And the, well, politics is very localized. Diffusion of technology, ideas, people, and product, and capital are becoming increasingly regional, if not global. You know, you, you mentioned this briefly. Let me bring out this question. How has your job in finding the companies with the best growth potential changed as a result of the entrance of three giant investors whose cost of capital is much lower than yours? By which, obviously, I mean Alibaba, Tencent, and SoftBank. They have financial and strategic agendas, and their cost of capital is so much cheaper than yours. Right. I think with, uh, take SoftBank as an example. Um, we have a number of portfolio companies that SoftBank invested in, and their pitch is quite simple. Basically, um, they will ask, tell the entrepreneur, we, we love you, we love what the business you're building. Um, we will love it if you take our money. If you don't, you know, we'll just give it to someone else who will compete against you. Yeah. And, um, and take rice sharing as an example. SoftBank is in DD in China. It is in Grab in Southeast Asia. Both are our portfolio company. And as a leverage, they, uh, for those in the audience that know, DD, Ola, uh, Grab, and Lyft had a roaming alliance. So SoftBank can go to Uber and say, we're already in two of the biggest markets in the world that compete against you, we could invest in you um, and facilitate more collaboration um, for you with the uh, um, counterparts in China and Southeast Asia, or we just give that money to Lyft and have Lyft compete against you. So it forced Uber to rethink how it should uh, analyze the entire market. Um, and have, having SoftBank, whose cost of capital obviously is lower than Uber's, it makes a difference. And in addition, with Tencent and Alibaba, both are very active making investments. And their cost of capital definitely is lower than ours. So what we have done, and many other funds have done, is start investing earlier and earlier. And then some of us are also growing our AUM so that we can have more chips to play with at a later stage when a company obviously is reaching a unicorn size. So you're going to see more mega funds happen. Sequoia is already doing that. And the rest of us are adjusting as well. There are some people who say, originally, these companies helped further innovation. Now they're impeding innovation. Do you agree with that analysis? I think yes and no. Um, if the uh, companies can leverage the capital to scale quicker um, and get to the end game, whether it's consolidation or M&A or, or, or IPO, then um, I don't think they're impeding uh, innovation. But you can argue the whim of one or two people can change the course of the entire industry. And the, prob the probability of things go wrong is a lot higher um, as a result, so, uh, much less predictable. So they also force you to almost um, not only race ahead to be number one in your category, but be wary of your competitor and figure out, um, game theory-wise, so you merge with a, by the number three guy, number four guy, so you can keep the number two guy in check. Um, what do you do to make sure that all the moves are kind of covered before the big boy come in to change the dynamic, dynamics of a category? So it forces all of us, both the VCs and entrepreneurs, to think several steps ahead. It uh, adds more pressure, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, you had said one way in which they change what you're doing is 
to make you an earlier stage Correct. investor. Does that also affect how you see exits? Do you look at these as your exit? I will nurture these companies and then I will flip them not to the public market, but to these giant investors. If the founders feel that they, they have a lot at stake, they don't want to get diluted, what will end up happening is that they'll take some of the investment from, from the SoftBank or Ali or Tencent in form of primary shares. They will also ask some of the existing shareholder to sell some. So if you're in a company early, you have more ownership to be able to facilitate a transaction by selling some of the shares. So I think it does help to create liquidity in the system, and at the same time, it makes a deal um, get done. Um, for some of us, I mean, beyond just going earlier, we're also investing in more geographies. We're investing in Southeast Asia more. We're looking at potentially Latin America, if not Europe. So we also are figuring out that, based on the investments that we have, um, what can we do to export some of that to other regions. In rice share and bike share, we're in uh, Didi in China, we're in Hello Bike, who is now number one, bigger than Ofo and Mobike in China. We're in Grab, which is in big in Southeast Asia, um, and then Grab and Goja, we'll see what happens with those two in Indonesia over time, whether they could be something more strategic between the two. And then um, uh, in the US, we're in Land Bike, which just announced an investment from uh, GV, uh, Alphabet, and then Uber last night. So the, these companies are increasingly um, uh, tying up with strategic money and also talk to each other in different geographies, whether it's for a roaming agreement or for something more. So as an investor, we need to become more global as well and to be able to continue to be relevant to our entrepreneurs. You know, there is so much money in tech these days. You know, what are the areas where you think that your money can play a catalytic role? Where will we see you, which areas of tech do you find most interesting today? Um, we break down our sectors in three buckets, consumer tech, enterprise tech, and then frontier tech. Frontier tech is more of the hottest areas with, with AI, machine learning, autonomous driving, Crypto is all we put under the frontier tech. What and about med tech? Med tech is something that we're thinking about. We haven't added yet, but we definitely feel that this is a very promising area. So um, my partner, Jenny Lee, leads our effort in frontier tech. She spent bulk of her time in China and uh, strategically um, some of the time in the US. Then uh, the enterprise tech tend to be more uh, either SaaS driven on um, marketing, on um, finance, on um, uh, human resource, um, leveraging big data, machine learning, and AI to improve efficiency of, 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 of enterprises. And in, includes uh, infrastructure, security, um, at the more fundamental sense. So it's more full stack way of investing. And, um, and that practice is being led out of Metal Park office. And we work with our China team members to see if we can help see enterprise market take off in China. Then um, with, now with Baidu and Tencent, Ali all have huge cloud centers. We see the Chinese uh, big internet companies now becoming uh, customers of US uh, enterprise tech solutions. So you start seeing more collaboration between the two sides than before in that area. And the third bucket is where I focus on is consumer tech. So my portfolio includes Xiaomi, which went public yesterday, and then um, uh, Xiaohongshu in uh, Shanghai in social commerce, ByteDance um, that has t Total and uh, TikTok and uh, Douyin. Um, my former portfolio includes uh, Dianping, which is not part of Meituan Dianping. Um, and then in the US, three of the top five shopping apps, number two, Wish, number three, Alphara, number five, Poshmark, are all my portfolio companies. And then number 20, uh, Ibotta. And then in uh, New York, Peloton, which we think is becoming quite an interesting community um, and uh, subscription business in addition to selling just hardware of uh, different kind of uh, excess equipments. And so um, we actually work with Airbnb on China and with Slack, we uh, work with them on uh, expansion on a global basis. So we have an interesting portfolio in New York, um, West Coast, uh, China, and Southeast Asia that we think has a lot of synergy with each other across the board. So, I mean, let, let's take one example. So you're invested in Airbnb, you're invested in Tutiao. 
or take other investments. You know, to what extent do you see value creation lying in consolidation, whether within one market or between markets? Right. I think with uh, DD and Grab, it's a perfect example. We became an investor in Grab first, and then in DD later, and we actively facilitated uh, my partner, Chi Xing Fu, uh, helped uh, DD to become an investor in Grab, and um, later bring in uh, uh, SoftBank. And, and you spoke about Grab and Gojek. Can you see merging the two? Because that would make both so much more valuable, for example. I think um, um, five, five, six years ago, um, my partner, Ji Xuing, helped to have Yoku and Tudou merge. That was number one and number three on the video uh, sites in, in, in China. And um, getting the merge was something that's revolutionary. Nobody else ever done that before in China. People always just fight to death. And then realize that, hey, this is actually a good way to gain scale and provide exits for some and let the, uh, whoever wants to keep on doing it build a bigger empire. And so you start to see that happen in other categories, whether it's Meituan and Dianping, or Uba and Ganji in Classified, or um, Didi and Kuaidi, and then uh, Didi and Uber, and now um, just more consolidations that happen. I think the lesson from China will be something that's quite telling for folks in Southeast Asia, India, and other places. So we, I think we will see more of that going forward. Is there a limit to which you can use consolidation to drive value. At what point do you have regulators coming in and saying, this is monopoly, you're subsidizing customers today, but tomorrow you won't be? Right. If we, if we look at, um, uh, in China, we did this anal analysis um, over the last uh, 10 years. In 2008, we looked at a number of the top 10 uh, market cap companies worldwide. Um, three were from China in banking, uh, telecom carrier, and oil and gas. Uh, China Petroleum, China Mobile, and ICBC. Um, the other seven companies were all from uh, US, and most of them are also in oil and gas financial institutions and telecom carrier. GE were, were, was the only exception, uh, as also Microsoft. And then um, fast forward to 2018, Seven of the top 10 companies worldwide are all technology companies, including Facebook and uh, uh, Amazon and um, Google and, and Apple and so forth. Two are from China, and that's uh, Tencent and Alibaba. So Tencent and Alibaba are worth more than any other state-owned enterprise in China. That's something, that's something that none of us, even people in China, expected. How could the Communist Party let the most valuable companies in China become these two venture-backed, foreign-listed companies. So the fact that those two don't get along and they compete against each other in every way, it's not a bad thing. It's safer for everybody. And so while well, consolidation tend to breed potentially a monopoly, if you have two or three big guys that continue to go at it at a very intense level, it's actually quite healthy for competition and for the entire ecosystem. We haven't seen the same level of intensity uh, in rivalry between amongst Google, Facebook, and uh, Amazon, and Apple in the US. Our predictions is that that will change as Amazon continue to get bigger and start dominating every category and have hardware and software services, AWS, e-commerce, advertising, that eventually Facebook and Google will respond much the same way that Tencent responded to, um, to Alibaba. I, I like to say that we don't need to be smarter we just need to have more data points. And we, we have the right data points. It can help us to kind of look ahead as what could happen in other markets. We have 30 seconds left, so monosyllabic answer, please. Are there any sectors that have too much money that you would absolutely stay away from in China tech? <laughs> There's definitely a lot of money in crypto. Um, and uh, we, we think that crypto has a lot of potential. But I think for the next... Uh, six months to a year, we probably won't be as active. We'll invest in Coinbase, we'll invest there in a Filecoin ICO, um, but right now there's just too many white papers around. We'll, we think that crypto will be extremely interesting, blockchain will be very critical uh, uh, technology, but we'll, we're willing to wait and see how to unfold. Thank you so much. I hope we both get to come back next year to see how these predictions play sure. out.